to know more such amazing stories from Indian history, click the bell icon and subscribe to Live History India. India is a country aspiring to be a global economic power while also facing up to critical challenges that have been holding it back. Grinding poverty, unemployment, low productivity and a young population that needs better opportunities. But where did India go wrong in its economic journey? How did it fall off even as the Asian Tigers and China march ahead starting the 1980s. Professor at Columbia University, economist, author and the first vice chairman of India's policy-making body, the Niti Aayog, Dr. Arvind Panagarya has been a critic of the path India chose in the early decades after its independence. Why and how does that hold back the India of today? Dr. Panagra, thank you so much for joining us today. You know, I have quoted extensively from your book, India Unlimited, but this is just one of the 15 books you've written on the uh, economy, on the evolution of India's uh, uh, economy over uh, the last couple of decades. So we're very excited to have you on this show, uh, which is going to be looking at the making of modern India from an economic standpoint. Uh, so I'm going to start off uh, in 1947, of course. But as an economist, looking back at that moment, uh, do you think we had any other option? And what do you make of the early years of India's economic uh, transformation? So, okay, you said making of modern India. So, you know, uh, I see that as consisting of two separate projects. One was the political project, which was uh, to establish India's democracy. And that was a very successful project, as we all would agree, I think. Um, but then there was an economic project, which uh, I would say was a failure, uh, 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 which is why, you know, when I talk of modern days, I don't use the term making of modern India, I talk of mo making of new India. Uh, and for me, new India begins 1991 uh, uh, with the reforms uh, by Prime Minister Nassim Rao. Okay, so that's sort of a little background uh, to the terminology that, uh, that uh, I would probably end up using. Um, now, um, on the economic side, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, the way I trace it is that the fundamental mistake we made, uh, initially you can say that there was general consensus and hardly any dissenters. You could find a dissenter here or there, but largely there was consensus around 1950s when we started that we had to pursue the planning route and there was generally also uh, agreement that uh, uh, industrialization was required and uh, uh, for that protection was necessary and so forth. So 50s, it, it was, was like that. Um, but I think, you know, as we went further, uh, and particularly this is where the comparison with some of the East Asian countries uh, kicks in, early, late 50s, early 60s, you begin to see that these other countries actually which had also chosen the path of import substitution, uh, began to now uh, 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 turn away from that policy and, and, and uh, become more outward oriented. Uh, this is particularly true of uh, South Korea, Taiwan, uh, 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 Singapore, those three, plus Hong Kong, of course, was always uh, um, a free trading uh, 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 entity. It was not a country, but an entity. And those four clearly were the uh, 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 entities that emerged eventually for trade economists uh, uh, in particular, but for economists in general, uh, as the uh, 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 examples of outward oriented development uh, to which eventually uh, most economists gravitated. I'm going to rewind a little bit before I come to the 1960s, because it's, it's, a, it's a very troubled decade for India, both in terms of economy as well as of course, many other aspects, but uh, there is a lot of criticism uh, about our first Prime Minister Jawaharlal Nehru's uh, 
decision to uh, take a slightly left of center path. Of course, Fabian socialism was uh, the, the dominating kind of thought process across Europe and many countries were looking at state control, more kind of a, a bigger role in, in, in the economy. But, uh, you know, there's a lot of recent research, Dr. Panagrea, about how the Bombay plan by the industrialists in 1944, for instance, was very, very in sync with what happened in the first five-year plan. So do you think, uh, you know, Nehru is being uh, overly criticized and the first five-year plan, at least in the 50s, I'm, I'm talking the first phase, was pretty much along the lines that we needed? Yeah, look, as I said, at that time, it's not just the Bombay plan, but most economists were also in agreement. Mm -hmm. uh, and some of the ardent, uh, uh, in some of the eventual kind of free trade uh, uh, advocates uh, actually were with it uh, 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 when India adopted the planned development model initially. Uh, and, and so, there's not too much disagreement with that. Um, but we kept going and kept going when things had become very clear that this model really was not working. And when the evidence you know, had become very clear that countries had, that had broken away from uh, uh, that consensus uh, and went outward uh, were doing much better. The evidence was very clear, but we really, refused to abandon that path. Even China, by late 70s, abandoned that path. And China was a communist country at that, not just a socialist country. Uh, so that is where I think you know, we, we went wrong. But let me step back a little bit where I think the most critical mistake was. Uh, even actually, you know, it's not simply the issue of socialism uh, in my thinking now. Uh, I mean, my own thinking has evolved since I wrote even the last book, The India Unlimited. Uh, I think the most critical mistake that we did, uh, uh, justifiable perhaps in the context at the time, was the adoption of self-sufficiency as the objective of policy. Uh, now, you know, I can understand at the time, you know, you said, as you said, we came out of this very kind of... Uh, 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 sorry past with, with, with colonial rule, fragmentation, and all sorts of things. And it was really a Herculean task to actually get the country's independence. And so Nehru perhaps felt very strongly that, you know, to preserve the political independence, it was essential for India to be also economically independent, which he interpreted to sort of mean essentially self-sufficiency. And there is plenty in his speeches writings, et cetera, you would see that he articulates this view that, you know, we don't want to be dependent uh, on the foreign markets to sell our goods or to get from the foreign markets goods that we ourselves need. We ought to be self-sufficient. Now, you see, the, the fundamental problem that arises with that objective for a country that is so, so low per capita income country, mm -hmm. that first of all, the incomes are very low all to begin with then at that low income, your savings are incredibly low. So you have very limited capital. Uh, and if self-sufficiency says that I got to produce, you know, the, uh, not just bicycles, but also automobiles or, and scooters and uh, uh, railway uh, engines and uh, perhaps even aeroplanes. So, you know, from the needle to the aeroplanes and everything in between. And then the metals to produce those and to the, the, the machinery that would be required to produce these items as well. You know that you haven't got the capital uh, to start any of these activities on any significant scale. Right. But this issue of being self-sufficient was kind of hard wired into the very uh, ideas that the Mahatma even spoke about from uh, Swadeshi to Charkha. These were the symbols uh, which were used to win our freedom. So wasn't it logical at that point uh, uh, to look at self-sufficiency also because, you know, we had just shed the yoke of colonialism. So in a sense, uh, logically speaking, you know, was there an option? There certainly was an option because in any case, we couldn't become self-sufficient, right? I mean, we, we, we didn't produce any planes. We still do not produce any planes, really, seriously speaking. Uh, so, so the whole objective that, you know, you're going to produce everything 
under the sun uh, was a flawed objective. Uh, uh, and, and, you know, at least uh, uh, by 60s, we should have uh, come to that realization. Uh, we, we, we did not. And, and actually, you know, then things got much worse because when uh, Nehru was succeeded by Mrs. Indira Gandhi as prime minister, uh, I would say Nehru's socialism was relatively a soft socialism. But Indira Gandhi's socialism was much harder. And she was surrounded by these, you know, London uh, school educated uh, uh, P.N. Huxer and so forth, who were very hardcore socialist, socialists. Right. I'm going to talk about the decade of the 60s, uh, uh, Dr. Panagre, because we often don't realize, you know, when we look back in his, at history, I mean, there are decades which um, are, are uh, tipping points. And for me, I think the 1960s was. So just to give you a timeline, 1962, we had the Indochina War. 1962, we had the Pandaji dying, passing away. In 1966, we, 1965, we had a war. In 1966, we had uh, uh, Lal Bahadur Shastri passing away. In 1966, you have the devaluation of the rupee when the, uh, when Indira Gandhi comes, because what we also have in 65, 66 is a terrible drought. And the devaluation of the rupee goes down very badly in the political circles. And that that's when she uses the uh, nationalization of banks as her a way of getting back and, and taking control. So this is the backdrop for what happened. So I'm very curious to know how you see, how you read between the lines and how this lurch towards the left kind of manifested itself. Well, to me, actually, there is one very important uh, 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 milestone you're missing there, which is 1957, 58. Yeah. What had happened was that uh, uh, as a part, uh, you know, India had actually participated in the Second World War on behalf of the uh, UK. Uh, and uh, for its services, uh, it uh, was receiving uh, vast volumes of uh, sterling, pound sterling uh, as payment uh, for, for its services. Now, these sterling balances were initially available to India to import products. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we were generally, you know, if you come up to 1957, we were generally more open uh, in terms of the imports. Uh, and at peak, actually, import to GDP ratio even hit uh, close to about 10% uh, uh, in, in some of those years. 1957-58, um, these sterling balances ran out. At that point, there was two options. Either we adopted some sort of foreign exchange budgeting, which is what we did actually without much discussion, or we could have devalued the rupee, which would have helped the exports to do better as well uh, and uh, made imports more expensive in terms of the rupees. So automatically that would have helped on the import side too. That's not what we did. There was hardly any discussion. I cannot find, you know, the only references I find is in uh, Beacon Nehru's uh, uh, autobiography. And he was the secretary DEA at the time. And he basically unilaterally made the decision to uh, 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 do foreign exchange budgeting, which basically, you know, tightened the hand of the government on everything much more than it was, which is what I meant, you know, initial socialism of Nehru was relatively light, you know, uh, uh, not only because it, it, he didn't nationalize any of the industries, but also because uh, uh, on foreign trade side, in spite of the objective of self-sufficiency, he maintained relatively liberal regime. Even on foreign investment, he remained much more liberal. Uh, but once you adopted foreign exchange budgeting, the hold of the bureaucracy became much tighter because not only investment license had to be obtained, but before you got the license, you had to ascertain that any machinery that you will need to import or any raw materials you will need to import is there for an exchange for it? Go to the finance ministry. And the finance ministry then got much tighter control of the whole process. Uh, uh, and, and that, you know, so you begin, once you be come into early 60s, uh, you, you begin to hear these stories about shortages, the, 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 the licensing taking so long and so forth. And committee after committee is appointed, you know, there are at least four or five committees appointed on in industry licensing, you know, what to do about it, et cetera, et cetera. So, so this, I think, foreign exchange adoption of foreign exchange budgeting, as opposed to you know considering a devaluation at that time, uh, was a critical milestone, you know, turning point to me. You know, it, it, 
devaluation turned out to be a, a political hot potato, Dr. Panagya. Do you think you would have been able to do it in the 57, 58 period if Indira Gandhi a decade later found it so difficult? Yeah, so Indira Gandhi's uh, circumstances turned out to be very different, you see, because food shortages were endemic, devaluation couldn't have helped with that, but then droughts happened. So any response to exchange rate that could have happened simply didn't happen uh, or happened very limited to a very limited degree. Uh, 57, 58 was a different uh, uh, situation. Actually, the economy was doing quite well. Uh, you know, if you look at the period from 1951 to 1964, the growth was about 4.3%, the average growth. So the, the economy was doing better. There was momentum at that time. And therefore, there would have been response to the devaluation in 57, 58. But 66, 67, two back-to-back -back droughts. And, and the economy was so closed. But you know, what is also interesting in, is we don't realize that in the post-war period, and when the Bombay plan happens, I mean, the industrialists are on a strong footing. India benefited because of the manufacturing capacity it had in the war years. Now, the first five-year plan also focused a lot on industrial growth, which was a good thing because it also benefited us later. Why did we cash in on this manufacturing? Was it because we were so focused on self-sufficiency within rather than export that we, you know, kind of started looking inwards? Because there was a moment where we could have captured a, 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 a wider market. Yeah, but you see, this ultimately goes down to this uh, diversification problem. That what what we decided was that you know we need to build up these other big industries, uh, what Nehru would call the heavy industry or the commanding heights of the industry. Uh, now, when you want to, when your capital is so limited, and you want to do these various large number of industries each of which is very capital intensive, what do you do? You start them at the minimum possible technologically feasible scale. You're not going to be competitive. Your, your global competitors are much at a larger scale than you ever can be with that limited capital. So you're not competitive in any of these industries. That was problem number one. So all capital basically got concentrated in industries which are highly capital intensive the commanding heights. No capital was left for the labor intensive industry where you actually had the comparative advantage at the global level. So what did we say? We said, well, for employment, what are we going to do? All, it, all of it goes to cottage industry. No, cottage industry can generate employment, but at a below subsistence level, it's not going to, you know, unless it becomes export oriented and it could potentially become export oriented because labor was so cheap. But when you don't give any capital to that, and you again force this scale, which is suboptimal, to succeed in the global economy. So you see the problem the, that in the heavy industry, because you had limited capital, and then you'd sort of spread it over large number of industries, you couldn't get the scale in the capital intensive industry to be competitive in the global marketplace. But then you have no capital left for the cottage industry or for the labor intensive industry, which then becomes cottage industry, because that's all you can do. You are not going to give them any capital. No, you know, if anybody applied for a license for a unit which would invest in plant and capital, uh, plant and machinery, more than a million rupees in apparel or some of these, you know, shoe or whatever other uh, uh, labor intensive industries, you would never get that license, even in the 1950s. It was clear that, you know, we are going to use the capital to build up these commanding heights. Right. In fact, your statistics prove that even today, more than half of India's companies or India's labor are in companies which employ less than five people. So that indicates just how small uh, Indian industry Exactly, exactly. Right. Exactly. I'm going to ask you, what was a tipping point that made the East Asian countries, uh, you know, because they were even ahead of China, actually, how, what was the tipping point that made them uh, take the, uh, uh, a different path? And I'm, I want to ask you this before I come to the city. Yeah, it, it, you know, precisely, you know, can we give an economic explanation for it, for, for why did they did do it? I do not know such. All I can say is that it's, it's ultimately the leadership that makes the big difference. Mm -hmm. uh, South Korea, Park Chung-hee, uh, Singapore, you got Lee Kuan Yew. And I think similarly, 
you don't have a visible kind of leader in Taiwan, but but similar leadership. Hong Kong was a different story because the British had maintained it as a sort of you know open port. Uh, uh, so so that story is a little different. Uh, but but that's uh, I, I mean it, in the end the leadership which is actually much more forward looking, much more progressive. They realized they had also done import substitution initially in the fifties, but then there was an issue whether they go into the second or third stage of import substitution, meaning, you know, should they go to the, sec, uh, you know, some of the inputs uh, and higher value added and so forth domestically, or they turn to the world markets and, and continue on this road of labor intensive industry. They chose the letter, you know, so they chose to say, well, you know, we'll become they outward. Also benefited greatly with the rise of Japan as an industrial power, as a manufacturing power. And I think one of the things that India hasn't done enough of is look east for collaboration. We've always been apprehensive. We were very apprehensive about the ASEAN. We were very apprehensive about looking east. Why do you think that happened? Well, I, I mean, for us, you know, we refused actually. I, I think uh, whether you uh, attribute it to very uh, a bureaucracy, which was very entrenched and would not uh, uh, simply yield to any uh, economic insights, or you say that the political class were also wedded to that view. Uh, uh, either way, I think, you know, it was a refusal to see the obvious. Uh, I mean, 1970, you already have Bhagwati and Desai books. Now, again, you know, if you go back, like I gave you examples of people who uh, converted later based on the evidence from uh, uh, East Asia. Jagdish Bhagwati is a good example, you know, early days, he was quite okay with socialist uh, policies, you know. Uh, uh, it is only the experience that taught them. So they wrote this book, he, so Padma Desai is his wife, and they together wrote the book in 1970, Planning for Industrialization. You can see that they are tolerant people at the time, you know, so the book title is Planning for Industrialization, right? They're not saying abandon planning. But they say there that, look, you know, you don't have to have licensing, industry licensing in everything. And you don't need licensing on imports. Remove the licensing and do the protection using tariffs. And let the exchange rate take part of the burden. You know, so that, that message is very much embedded in, 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 in that kind of uh, uh, ethos of India. Only that it's a little more kind of on the side of the markets. But they got completely kind of ignored, neglected. They got no traction whatsoever. I mean, it's only much later that we go back and say, oh, you know, the two of them wrote this. I mean, we were wedded to Amartya Sen kind of thinking at the time. Right. Totally. Uh, you know, we will come to uh, come to that debate with, of, of which way uh, development has to go in India, which is the best path. But I'm going to ask you, the nationalizations of banks, uh, the nationalization of banks, uh, Dr. Panagya, do you think that was one of the, the biggest... Uh, you know, mistakes that happened at the point it happened. Because, uh, you know, even the thinking at that point in close circles was, hey, now that the banks are have been nationalized, now we can use all the money that is in the banks to really look at uh, uh, the, the areas that the government wants to focus on. So it was almost as though the government could dip into the banks. So, I mean, do you think that was a, a very big negative? Well, it was a major change. Uh, uh, not the least because this was the first major nationalization, which was also uh, uh, a negation of Nehru. I would say negation. Uh, uh, somebody may say that it was a continuation. It was negation to me because Nehru was very clear that he wanted to give uh, uh, space to the private sector because he believed in private sector being a partner in development. And so uh, he explicitly ruled out nationalizations. Uh, but Mrs. Gandhi kind of uh, changed that. Uh, and this became the first, and then the second insurance came in, then the coal mines came in, then the oil companies came in, the copper, uh, steel, you know, uh, we simply did not stop. And also, I suppose, you know, in terms of the evolution, probably this is the time uh, uh, in bank nationalization may have been the turning point in the sense of, you know, some of our very socialistically uh, minded bureaucrats uh, uh, seizing uh, essentially the control of policy. You know, uh, that brings me to a question, which is kind of an overarching theme. And as a journalist who's covered both politics and business, uh, Dr. Panagra in India for many years, I've always found a distrust 
that Delhi has towards Bombay and business on the whole. There are two parallel worlds out here. Have you sensed, I mean, you, you were the, the founding vice chair of Niti Aayog. Did you also find there is a disconnect between uh, Delhi and Bombay? Uh, there's somehow a sense that business and profitability is not a good thing, even now. No, I don't think this is this 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 is. I mean, in this, I mean, it's it's not Delhi Bombay divide. It's simply this this uh, ethos kind of uh, uh, in 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 our veins that uh, um, somehow profits are a bad thing, mm -hmm. and and so therefore you know and 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 really the 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 part of the political discourse really goes that way also till today, right? You know, you do anything or. I mean, look at the way uh, 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 the, the farm debate has also evolved, like, right? I mean, first, who got attacked first? You know, the towers uh, that were thought to be owned by uh, Ambani's, uh, which, which actually turned out they didn't own them. Um, but, but, you know, the, there is this uh, intense kind of uh, um, uh, uh, pushback to, to industry. Uh, to, to profitability. I think that, that that also is coming from the socialist past, you know. We, we, we Why is that so ingrained in the mindset of people, you think? Why do you have this distrust? Because are we looking at crony capitalism as our benchmark? Because in the US, job creation is celebrated, you know, at the local level, at the county level, at the state level, at the, at the center level. Over here, the discourse is about, hey, are they, are they pleasing? I've never been able to understand. What is your sense? No, I, the, uh, you see, it, it goes back to the political leadership at the end of the day that, you know, the political leadership is not often prepared uh, and the, 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 the people to say that, look, you know, somebody has to create wealth. Uh, I think this, this selling of reforms, so to say, generally speaking, you know, even during the Narsim Rao days, uh, if you look back at those speeches, you know, even the, uh, uh, you know, here I differ with many of the uh, 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 other uh, uh, observers uh, uh, in, in my reading of that speech of uh, Manmohan Singh uh, in, in, Ju in July 1991, uh, if you look at, there is this kind of uh, 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 messaging that, no, we are not making a big change. This is a continuation of what Rajiv Gandhi did. And, you know, it, it is uh, uh, more or less, uh, uh, we are working in the same policy framework. Wasn't true. I mean, the policy framework was completely changed in 1991. You know, we basically said that, okay, we have had it with the uh, uh, planning and with the licensing and so forth, and we are not turning to markets. Uh, it, the entire framework was actually transformed and changed. Uh, but, but you see, in the public policy space, when they go, I think Vajpayee, Prime Minister Vajpayee was the first one who actually went out and said that growth is good. And we want uh, a nine to ten percent growth to combat poverty, because we cannot combat poverty without growth. There's a lot of political baggage when it comes to reform. There are hard lines that people have drawn, irrespective of what you know they have done when they are in power. The moment you're in opposition, your job is to criticize. But we will come to that. I want to get back to the 70s. By the 70s, the tide had turned. We had gone into more control, more uh, more left leaning, and at, at that time. The East Asian countries and then China started building up. How do you see, if you look at the statistics, the divergence and what is the damage that decade of the 70s till mid 80s? Because again, 84 onwards, we did have some kind of a opening up. But that decade of 70s to the early 80s, uh, as an economist looking back at India, what did that change of direction mean for us as an economist? Yeah, well. It, that was the 70s was the lost decade. Uh, you know, if you look at, I left India in 1974, and if I look back the decade prior to that, so practically 65 to about 75, let's say, uh, hardly any change in the living standards, hardly any, because you're growing per capita terms less than 1% a year. That's not a perceptible change. It's not something you'll perceive. Maybe 10 years later, you see some little bit of change. So, so it was a lost decade, very, very sad period in, in our economic history. Um, and it sort of continued the some, you know, uh, change began to happen uh, very, very piecemeal and ad hoc in the second half of the 70s, uh, some more in, in the uh, first half of the 80s. Second half of the 80s did a little bit better, kind of, you know, Rajiv Gandhi, I, I thought was uh, a bit more kind of, uh, you know, younger, 
uh, take India to 21st century, believed in information technology. Uh, so, you know, we, we, we saw some more action, but unfortunately in his case also, first two years of his rule, he did well, but then he lost steam. Uh, and, and the reforms that he really started with a bang actually in his first two budgets. Uh, because I, I think, you know, his, his own finance minister turned against him and so forth, uh, VP Singh, uh, and then Bofors uh, scandal. And so, so you know, politically he, he became much weaker. Uh, so that was a bit of a sad thing to have happened. But uh, yeah, you know, 70s is the decade, so much nationalization happened, so many mistakes happened. Inflation, there was a couple of years time, you know, when inflation really was for the first time we hit double digit, uh, actually 20% or more, in fact, for, for two, two years. Uh, so it, it, was, it was a bad time. Let's come to the 90s, uh, the, the wave of reforms that came, came with a big bang, okay? And we've all seen the, the impact of that, Dr. Panagri, I'm not going to go into that. But what has uh, also been very stark is the inability to push reforms to the second phase of reforms. You know, in many sectors, you look at electricity, you look at power, some of the important segments and sectors, we've not been able to push the second generation of reforms. This is something that many people have spoken about. Governments have come, governments have gone. It's been difficult. So. If we were to achieve that 8% plus growth for multiple years, and that is what we need to really come out and really have the per capita income of a developed country, can we do it without these second generation reforms? And what has kept the second generation reforms at bay? Yeah, no, I'm not so pessimistic actually. You know, a lot of very tough reforms have happened, uh, 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 labor laws. There is still, you know, but about, I would say, 90% uh, uh, of the changes that were required in labor laws have happened. There is maybe 5%, 10% left, you know, which states are fully authorized to do purely by notification. And I hope some of the states will do it. So I, labor law was a very big, difficult reform. Uh, Bankruptcy Act. I mean, I had written, uh, you know, for at least 15 years that we need a modern bankruptcy law that nobody would do it. Finally, Modi government did it. Goods and services tax, uh, very difficult one, got done. Uh, uh, corporate profit tax now down to, you know, 17% for new manufacturing firms and 25% uh, for all of the rest. Uh, uh, so, you know, these are some of the mega reforms, uh, not easy reforms, but they've got done. My own that I sort of contributed to the medical reform, the all entire medical education regulatory system has been you know, we were living under, under 1950s antiquated laws uh, replaced completely, uh, you know, and, and uh, people thought that the, the, the Indian Medical Council was so powerful, it will never happen. So a lot of difficult reforms have happened. There are some difficult ones still uh, uh, we are struggling with. Farm laws are one example of it, uh, but uh, you're right, electricity, electricity reform, uh, then the issues of food corporation of India, the entire you know public distribution system, etc. That that still remains. But but I think if we can do a few more little things, you know, not necessarily the very big things, uh, privatization, for example, uh, I think we are there to get to eight percent plus. So I'm going to now come to uh, this book where you have actually laid out some of the fundamental problems that we face as an economy. I'm going to start off with unemployment and underemployment, both in the farm sector and the industry sector. The data that you put out is very stark. And at the end of the day, the only way poverty is going to go is if there is employment and productivity increases. Uh, now, um, where do you think the genesis of this is? Because this is the same country where you had the green revolution create immense wealth, the white revolution transform uh, space. But you have said that post the green revolution, our focus became again on not investing more behind agriculture, but really about taking care of the farmer. And then it becomes a political kind of uh, space. So is that where the disconnect happened according to you? Yeah, well, you know, agriculture has remained unreformed except for the recent farm laws, which are still in a bit of a transition. Um, uh, and also in agriculture, uh, you know, uh, rather than do public investment in agriculture, uh, we turn into, giving subsidies. Uh, so you got fertilizer subsidy, water subsidy, electricity subsidy, um, uh, uh, you know, you name it. Then also subsidy from MSP, of course, you know, that's a very large subsidy. Um, 
uh, and so the resources that could have been used to build up uh, the public investment in agriculture ended up becoming subsidies to farmers. And often these subsidies become regressive. You see, it's the bigger, you know, who is going to use fertilizer subsidy, who is going to use uh, seed subsidy, uh, water subsidy, MSP. These are larger farmers. Uh, so they also end up being largely regressive. Uh, you know, so if we really wanted to, really wanted uh, these resources to reach the poor, then we should have done cash transfers long back. Um, so, so that's the agriculture problem, but the agriculture problem does spill over into industry because, you know, one of the uh, industries that can create good jobs where the farmers can more easily also transition is the food processing industry. Mm -hmm. uh, we hardly have any food processing industry, very uh, small food processing industry. We ought to be much, much larger, you know, and, and that's where the uh, farmer uh, uh, and, and industrial job link is, is direct. Uh, but by and large, I think the bigger problem really uh, is, is the creation of uh, uh, well-paid jobs, uh, which uh, would not require too much training, too much education, because, you know, when you're trying to get people out of farming into something else, uh, it, you can't employ them in finance industry or IT industry or petroleum refining and so forth, you know, I mean. Uh, uh, and, and that has been uh, one, one of the key problems at every level you see that this, there's not this recognition uh, uh, on the part of anybody, either we talk, uh, whether it is the industrialists or the policymakers, we are all enamored by this very high tech, you know, we want to build planes, we want to build uh, uh, our railway engines, we want to build the automobile, uh, automobiles, whatnot, you know, whether it's the our big industrialists or it is our, whether, whether it's our government, when it comes to stitching clothes, uh, uh, making shoes, uh, uh, making furniture, it's not for us. We and you know, uh, this has also been a big problem because, you know, if you see in textiles, for example, there was a time when we were uh, very good at textile, man I mean, uh, garment manufacturing, we've lost it completely to Bangladesh, to Vietnam, to all of these countries. But, you know, the, the larger problem is that the manufacturing, the mass scale manufacturing, the assembly line manufacturing that is really essential uh, to, to a kind of absorb this kind of labor is not happening. I remember in 2011, the great manufacturing policy came in. Everybody was talking about it. We, we, we don't have a dearth of policies. Sir. What we have is why is it translating to something? You know? And then one could then argue that should we do import substitution, say that everybody who's got operations in India should have factories in India to produce in India, is that the, good, the right path to do? How do we get globally competitive when the export market is not firing either? Absolutely. No, no, I mean, I think, you know, glo global competitiveness requires looking out, not looking in. Uh, when you look in, you are going to go back to these smaller uh, uh, enterprises. You see, when you give me, the, uh, uh, even take the auto industry, when you give me 125% tariff protection, I'll just put in a lot of small plants because I don't need to be competitive globally. I, 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 as long as uh, nothing comes from outside, uh, even my small plants will do fine and I have no plans to go and compete in the global economy. So even our auto industry, you know, protected for 70 years, today has less than 1% share in the global marketplace. Two wheelers in fact, by contrast, have done much, much better, you know, they look out. Uh, they are selling almost 30 40 percent of their output abroad. So they are, and they also are therefore, you know, whenever uh, demand slows down domestically, they don't suffer as much. You know, they don't. Uh, uh, but but largely, when we try to build these industries based on the domestic market alone, you end up with these smaller enterprises. Uh, even in look, you know, uh, in in uh, mobile manufacturing, uh, I can't think of a single local manufacturer. Uh, uh, who is uh, uh, at a scale at which uh, uh, it'll become some sort of powerhouse of exports of mobile phones. Right. Uh, we've outsourced very quickly everything to China and this uh, 2020 proved that, right? I mean, we, we, it, it just indicated how dependent we are on China for the back end. But I'm going to ask you about uh, the, the manufacturing bit in, in a little bit more detail. What do you think needs to be done to really get manufacturing going? Because your critics argue that what you are comparing India with, the Southeast Asian tigers of the 70s, the, the situation is not, it's not an apples to apples comparison because at that time they were feeding a booming market in the US, a bo booming global export market. 
today it's not the same situation and we yeah, yeah, yeah. replicate this is a standard line of the critics you see this is a standard line because previously also that oh you know south korea is small taiwan is small singapore is the city country hong kong is a city country you know it doesn't apply to us and all then what happens late 1970s china sort of opens up bigger than india at that time even much bigger than india because indian population was way behind china's at that time socialist communist country they open up go 10% growth you know etc cetera, etc cetera. the question is that are the fundamentals any, any, any of any problem now you say that oh the world economy was booming no when china grew up world economy was not booming when korea and taiwan grew yes then the oecd country growth was uh, uh, much higher uh, uh, and what is the size of the global export market in uh, uh, let's say about around 2000 when china really chinese exports truly start booming it's about 6 trillion dollars 6 trillion dollars today uh, uh, and maybe another couple of trillion maybe services so maybe 8 trillion today the export market is 25 trillion it is 25 trillion alone merchandise Uh, exports alone is 19 and a half trillion i mean i'm not to- counting the covid year i'm talking prior pre covid numbers uh, and we'll get back there so what are we talking the world economy global econ- even let's forget you know you could might say that all oh, this includes all this in, uh, 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 all these very high top tech products and so forth let's leave it just to apparel 800 billion dollar market what have we got out of it just less than 20 billion footwear so our numbers are appalling in in many categories sir. but you know when you so, say so then how does it how how do the what is the response of the critics here i know i agree but my question to you is that when you say china opened up what you really mean is china said i am going to go out and get the market right there was That's a depression then and i have spoken to big industrialists who who lament that you know china has Uh, been a champion of its flag bearer industries and companies, and it's really gone out there to help them. And in the Indian government hasn't done enough. So there is one criticism over there. But the second point is that if you see, yeah, you want to answer. That's a question. wrong criticism. I mean, there is not knowing the history of China and all. Look, I mean, China is is poorer than India in 1980. Look up the data. Our, our per capita income is uh, 10 to 15 percent higher than China's. Where did they get the money to subsidize the industries? it was a good policies you think shenzhen was created by subsidies shenzhen was a bunch of fishing villages in 1980 total population about 300000 nothing there if you look at the pictures you know go to the internet and check the pictures of uh, you know shenzhen 1980 you will even get pictures of the same spot in 2015 or 2013 and in 1980 and just see the contrast what happened you, you think subsidies did that But we also did that. We had the SECs. We had so many SECs that. No, all... no, 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 no. What happened? We... To that? Nothing happened. Yeah, be- because our labor laws, our land laws were so uh, rigid. Who would do it? I mean, when you say that you, if if you are a company of hundred workers or more, under no circumstances can you terminate any worker. Do you think people are going to uh, create companies of two hundred thousand workers, let alone ten thousand? I mean, you need the scale. The, the, the Chinese allowed all that. The Chinese, you know, the story is that Deng Xiaoping comes to the coast, looks there, uh, there is uh, Hong Kong, and looks there, there is uh, uh, <coughs> Taiwan. Is uh, you know what are they doing right and what are we doing wrong? He says he realizes what we what they were doing wrong on the, the mainland. Opens up the whole thing, you know, and and these uh, uh, special zones, etc. They create. the special zones were not like our scz our scz we think that we we make smaller and smaller i mean i remember a proposal coming to me when i was at the niti ayog saying that oh we should have these smaller scz so that smaller states can also have them okay that's not the objective of the scz scz is to create a very large space where policies are good uh, where uh, a, a, a lot of agglomeration can happen Uh, and uh, but but we see these only as giving as as basically you know sops we want to give sops that's the only way we see the scz 
So these tiny little operations, you think they will create agglomeration? What I advocate therefore in the book is, you know, whatever these coastal autonomous zones or uh, so forth that I mentioned, you need an area of 300 kilometers, 500 kilometers, where you say that, look, give the local autonomy to make good policies. Let them choose the labor laws. I mean, Shenzhen can make its own labor laws. It can make its own land laws. Right. You know, there are many aspects like this, and I won't even get into infrastructure because we all know the travails of India's infrastructure, be it urban infrastructure, be it uh, infrastructure for migrant labor, for all of that. But you know, I am going to ask you um, a larger question. Now, you look at China, it seems to have a vision. And I, you know, if you read uh, Peter Fractopan, all of these modern uh, authors who looked at China and the socioeconomic kind of environment, so you have them creating industries, creating wealth out of those industries for their people, going and acquiring resources across the world, becoming a political power, the whole over one belt, one uh, road policy that they have come up with. Now they're flexing their muscles. And uh, gradually, I think even after 2020, they've emerged as one of the strongest powers in terms of economic value. There seems to be a plan, uh, Dr. Panagra, right, wrong, whichever way, but there is an ambition and there is a plan. In India, we seem to be still grappling with, with various issues, developmental questions, back and forth on this. Uh, uh, how do you compare the two? What is the vision that we have? Uh, uh, ours seems to be, you know, because our biggest problem is our per capita. And I think we should forget looking at GDP and look at only per capita, but that's my view. But what is your view? What do you think? I mean, do we have a plan? Are we just going to be sliding lower and lower in comparison? And I'm using China as only one example. Yeah, you know, every country has a plan. And, and you know, we had many plans, so many five-year plans, you know. So. What is that plan? <laughs> but, no, but, but no, I think, I mean, I personally, having worked rather closely with Prime Minister Modi, I, I, I mean, he's a man of vision. There's no doubt, you know, I, and even I remember my, my very first big meeting after uh, I joined the NITI uh, he had a clear vision, you know, which I, to me, I mean, I understood his, that vision only gradually, uh, but, but there's no question. So, so, so that's there. I, I, I think the problems are of different nature. I mean, now a lot of the things that the central government needs to do or needed to do, it has done. There are a few things here and there left, but it really not the problem arises at the state level. You see that uh, like workers have to migrate from uh, rural areas, from agriculture into industry and services into urban areas. Our urban spaces are just not prepared, you know, I mean, you look at a lot of the development, real serious wealth creation happens in urban, sec uh, uh, urban centers. Now in China, I mean, I remember this from a, a visit in, in, in the, uh, it was either 1989 or 1990, 1990. Uh, you know, the mayors of the cities, most of them engineers were so competitive, so competitive. Mm -hmm. They wanted to do things for their cities. In our cities, there is no power that the, there no, you know mayors are in name only. It's the municipal commissioner who calls all the shots. Uh, so, so you know these kinds of these are the kinds of problems now. You know the, the land laws. Look at what happens. You know, industry typically comes on the periphery of a city, but the periphery of the city is all agricultural, and the revenue departments who have the authority. Uh, would not allow the conversion of agricultural spaces into for non-agricultural use. So this is a land becomes a constraint. Uh, and of course, in general, Chinese government uh, is, is uh, and, and this is true of the South Koreans under Park Chung-hee and uh, uh, of uh, Singapore under Lee Kuan Yew, the ability to deliver of the government is a lot better there in those countries than, than it is in ours. Uh, and so when it comes to basic things, you know, that industry needs the electricity, the spaces, the, you know, ability to construct, do construction rapidly. I mean, in India, you know, you try to build anything, so many, so many permissions, etc. you require, takes forever. So those are the kinds of things, other than my fundamental one, which is that you need to break this impasse and labor intensive industry, you have to create a space for that. So. It is with these kinds of things in mind that I've been suggesting that look, you know, create some Shenzhen-like uh, uh, pockets in the country, because 
development doesn't happen in every single state it is the people from every single state who migrate to where the development is i mean look at china vast part of china is left out meaning that you know that's not where industry is it's the coastline you know you go on the eastern side pretty much you know that's where it all is you have to let this concentrate and we got such a long coastline you know uh, and our ports are uh, in, in such a bad condition i mean you know there, there's there's so much that we can do over there yeah. but tell me something uh, at the end is it a question of governance and and uh, mental blocks you think uh, that has kept india uh, you know not uh, or i have kept india away from achieving its goal well i i would say it was the bad policies first and foremost past, but that's in the past sir. i'm talking about the last 25 years i think if you were to look at the last 25 years let's leave the past behind and yeah, see yeah, yeah. In the last 25 years is this still the biggest uh, stumbling block for india no, no, but but the I past is yeah but the past doesn't leave you unfortunately you see because uh, first of all a, a lot of the past is being shed in in the recent years you know for example we kept saying about the labor laws but they didn't happen and even now even now that limit has been raised to 300 from 100 to 300 but if i'm larger than 300 i still don't have the uh, authority to terminate workers uh, uh they have provided some back door through these fixed term contracts but that's not enough you know you you have to allow this you know so even now the policy is not fully there i admit 90% we are there As, as far as central government is concerned, uh, for states, I think some more ne work needs to be done. So that certainly is 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 there. Uh, certainly, the ability of the government to deliver uh, has been quite poor actually in India compared to some of these successful countries. Is no doubt, and so therefore the governance becomes critical. But again, governance has has improved under Prime Minister Modi. Is no doubt so much of digitization has happened. For example. Uh, uh you know a lot of the services uh, or, or even for the businesses you know when they have to deal with filings and so forth a lot of digitization has happened i talked to the business people and you know so of course it will take entrepreneurs themselves to learn how to use those digital facilities etc but but it has happened so governance is improving certainly a lot better under prime minister modi than under some of the previous governments uh but still long way to go but also you know other things where the government has shot its, itself in the foot uh the land acquisition act of 2013 you know it becomes it is now made it so expensive for the government to acquire land that for road even these are linear projects roads when you build them right but today to build the road three fourths of the cost is the land acquisition of the land now you know how can you uh, in a, no no infrastructure building can progress rapidly if that is how much you have to spend uh, uh just on acquisition of the land so so there are still things that that keep us in the policy i mean this is the policy that we 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 have put into the land acquisition act uh, uh and now it's a lot of see the, one of the problems is that when you uh, uh, there, there are issues of social kind of you know where uh, you are trying to benefit certain groups once you have done it it's impossible to take them back this is why you have to be very careful i'll tell you one example you know that uh, at niti ayog one of the very senior officers wanted to start some sort of urban equivalent of narega and i had to nip the bud you know because uh, once you open this discussion uh, in public policy space and all it's very difficult to withdraw it because social benefits is one thing which you know once you are put it it's almost impossible to withdraw and same with the land acquisition now it's very difficult to for any government to come in and say that look you know i'm not going to pay this kind of high premium on the land acquisition right so i have two questions and they might sound simplistic but the whole idea of the series is to really ask basic questions you know so one is that in india we've had governments of different views dr banerjee we have right to center left to center communist regional parties etc etc but yet the problems persist so irrespective of ideological leanings we have not been able to solve the poverty issue it is still grinding poverty we are a country aiming to be one of the largest economies of, of the world with a lot of third world issues even there even now persisting where do you see the problem again is it coming down to this policy governance and uh, mindset 
Well, one thing, since I live in the US, some of the third world problems remain here also. <laughs> I mean, we saw what happened, you know, during the recent uh, uh, snowstorm uh, in, in, in Texas. Uh, but anyway, but, but I think you're right. Uh, uh, in our case, perhaps uh, still we are struggling with the abject poverty uh, uh, in terms of, you know, people being able to have at least a decent living. Uh, that, that is an issue persisting. Uh, but to me, again, you know, ultimately the, the boats are lifted by wealth creation. And uh, uh, squarely we need to focus on wealth creation. Look, you know, when we even think of these very successful uh, Nordic countries, you know, which we think as the model of socialism and so forth, the fact of the matter is that the policies uh, don't interfere with wealth creation. Uh, their socialism comes at the stage of expenditure that, you know, tax expenditure. Basically, they use, uh, uh, so, so they let the wealth creation to go. Uh, uh, one of the problems I tell you uh, in, in, in our country is that we want to turn every single program into a redistributive program. Mm -hmm. Anything we do, you know, there has to be first, uh, for some specific groups, we have to do something otherwise, you know, you know, so. Even like, for example, uh, uh, when we were opening the retail uh, trade, uh, no, no, 30% you have to buy domestically. I mean, this is the foreign direct investment in, in, in retail when we were opening in 2013. That still, I think it's the same law, uh, unless you make an exception for somebody that acquired 30% of it domestically. You know, I mean, <laughs> Let, let the guys come in and do good work and automatically just allow them some time. They will start buying 30, more than, more than 30%, they'll start buying domestically. But if, if you hamstring them from the beginning, before you enter, uh, then no entry happens. So you didn't, you know, you thought you'll get 30%, but nobody entered. No F, uh, FDI happened. And we do that repeatedly with every single program that we put in place. So, so we have to make sure that wealth creation uh, is permitted, then tax and redistribute, you know, from the, do the, do the uh, social programming at the expenditure stage, but creation don't do that. Let them, you know. Right, absolutely. Well said. My last question is that we have our ambition to be a $5 trillion economy uh, in the next couple of years, be one of the largest economies. But if it is status quo, and you know, one can argue, and that that's the other argument, that doing nothing, the Indian economy will automatically grow because there's so many people moving up the, uh, uh, the, the, the chain of prosperity and hence the elephant will walk slow, but it will walk. But my question to you is that without addressing these fundamental issues, Dr. Panagam, do you think this, this $5 trillion economy is possible or is it going to be meaningful? Because at the end of the day, as I come back to our per capita income is so low, that you know, we really need to address that. And unless that is addressed, we will not be able to walk out of uh, the, the situation we are in. No, no, look, other countries have walked out of it. So, so can we, uh, you know, uh, and, and uh, just, just to correct the narrative also, you know, uh, uh, from op pessimism to optimism, uh, it's, it's not that we have not done well. Uh, if you take the period from 2003-04 to 2019-20, so 17 years. Our average growth, most people don't know this, but our average growth during this period has been 7.4%. Now it's not 10, we are still, you know, it's, it's almost to about two and a half percent uh, behind 10%, uh, uh, but 7.4% for a vibrant democracy uh, where things are so difficult to do is no mean achievement. Uh, and therefore that tells you that good policies do pay off. Uh, uh, and, and so we had ups and downs, you know, like 1920, uh, 2019, 20 year, we fell to 4.2%, but that's accounted for in the 7.4% average growth that, that I mentioned. So, so I think we can do it. Uh, uh, how, uh, how long it'll take to get to 5 trillion is, is, is uh, uh, you know, it's, it's a matter of arithmetics, you know, how long it takes from at something like 8% or so. I think we will do 8%. So a lot has been done. So I do think that we will get to 8%, but there is a few more things if we do, we can hit 10. I mean, I don't believe that democracies cannot grow at 10 because previously also they said democracies cannot grow beyond five or six, uh, uh, which is what Chile had done you know, for a long period of time. Uh, but uh, uh, we have done seven, almost seven and a half now. So, so I think we can get to 10, 
uh, but a few more things do, do need to be done. And these are not uh, uh, things that cannot be done. I think we can do them. What are uh, the top, top four or five things that have to be done to get to the plan? Well, right now, first of all, you know, since we are think, talking in terms of the 5 trillion target rather than 10 trillion, uh, uh, immediately we have to get down to doing a few things. Financial sector is in stress. It will The stress will rise actually as we, uh, uh, you know, come out of COVID, some bankruptcies, et cetera, will happen. Even RBI is uh, uh, predicting that uh, more NPAs are uh, on the way. Uh, so that cleanup has to happen rapidly uh, and recapitalization. So the government has chosen to, to, to take the path of cleanup through this uh, uh, bad bank, but then the government really needs to put that bad bank on its feet quickly. Because you know, if it puts, it, if it takes them three years to put the bad bank in place, then you know, again, the credit growth will not happen that is required and all. And you know, credit is really like the you know water which gets everywhere. Uh, and, and, and so 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 you so you need to fix that very quickly. Second, this is uh, uh, we had the latest uh, uh, GDP figures come in for the third quarter, so we have actually at least come back to uh, uh, the, the level where we were uh, a year ago, which is very good news. Uh, and, and that sets the stage, I think, for uh, returning to 7-8% uh, very quickly. Uh, so I would uh, give some hand uh, through demand uh, stimulus. Uh, but you know that, again, has to be done rapidly. So in addition to front-loading a lot of the expenditures, you know, front-load them and start you know, do it in this quarter. Why wait till the, the next quarter? Uh, uh, and enough provision is made actually in the uh, in, in the uh, revised estimates for the 2021 budget for this last quarter of that year. Uh, uh, but plus, you know, there are a lot of areas that the government, central government, needs to pay. Uh, uh, GST areas are there. Uh, uh, there are tax refunds of the individuals, households, very large sums. Uh, then you got a lot of the services that uh, uh, and goods that have been provided to the government for which payments have not been made. These are the payments. If you make them quickly, clear all the areas very quickly, they will convert into expenditure very quickly also. So in the short term, these are a couple of the things that, that they definitely need to do. Now for then get the economy uh, to, to, to uh, pick up at 8% plus, uh, we, some of the states uh, and my candidates would be obviously Gujarat and Uttar Pradesh here because both of them were saying that we want to do this, uh, which is, on the labor law, raise that limit. All they have to do is the issue a notification that the limit below which enterprises have the right to terminate workers is raised from 300 to maybe 10,000. So allow the large firms to, to come in that, that way. Uh, states have to do another thing, which is you know conversion of land from, Karnataka, by the way, has done something there. Uh, I, I've not looked at uh, carefully uh, to, to be sure exactly, you know, whether that will work or not, but uh, certainly they have taken some steps, you know, to conversion of land, uh, because, you know, you want to be able to provide land to the enterprises that want to start in the periphery of the city. Uh, uh, some emphasis also has to begin happening on uh, 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 dormitory housing for migrant workers. Uh, uh, you see, when migrant workers come in, they need a place to live. Uh, you know, they're not very demanding. Uh, they are able to rough it out and all, uh, but you know if they don't find anything, then the slums get created. Uh, I mean that's a perfect way that that, that uh, you create slums in the cities. Uh, our emphasis, I think, of housing policy has been wrong, which is to give houses to everybody. Uh, but you know I would rather use the government resources to create this dormitory housing, uh, so that the migrant workers can come in and you know reduce their cost. Uh, and perhaps invest a little bit more in providing some sort of health coverage to the migrant workers. Uh, uh, so, so that sort of eases up the burden of the enterprises also to some degree. So those are the things I would do. Right, and absolutely. And then the last point is very well taken because 2020 showed us the crisis over there in, in the urban landscape, the migrant labor space, the heat up. Dr. Panagra, we covered a long uh, distance of the economy, of the evolution of the country, and uh, you uh, raised some very, very pertinent points. As always, loved talking to you and getting your insights. Many thanks for joining us. My pleasure, many. Thanks for having me.